All right. Everybody ready to dig into our Father's Day? Yes? No? All right. Let's do it. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, as we've said already here today, we're so grateful for dads. And Lord, we love the way you put men and women together, and out of their love come our offspring. And Lord, we appreciate our children so much, and we appreciate so much what you're doing to uh, model for us fatherhood. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank God for all the men that are in this church that are strong, healthy, dynamic, responsible men. And Lord, we thank you for all of us men. Thank you for our wives. And Lord, we thank you for the way you made life work. And so, Heavenly Father, now we just pray that you'll take this time and use this time so that we can see what, how good dads think and, and what good dads value and how fatherhood works. Lord, we love you this morning and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here's what we did this week. You know, in the past, sometimes on Father's Day, I've uh, set four chairs up here and we have four of our strong uh, eldership men uh, share with us about being a father and raising kids and all that kind of thing. Where I thought this year we would choose some of the guys that Gail and I highly respect as great dads, and of course there are many more than these four that we respect as great dads, but we thought we would work it through incrementally, starting with Kyle, who's a young father, and working up to the old fathers and the grandfathers, and just talk about some of the principles of fatherhood. And then we thought we would interject right in the middle of that, Gail Haggard, to give her comment on how much she loves dads. That's what you're going to talk about, right? All right, now you are. Okay. And it's an interesting thing because this fatherhood thing tends to happen somewhat naturally for men to do what men do. But the scripture says that older women are to teach younger women how to love their husbands. There is not a reciprocal passage. There is no passage that says older men teach younger men how to love their wives. Now, we know from every week in the men's Bible study, those lessons are taught. Our men's Bible study it meets up there. It's a jam-packed meeting. It's very, very exciting. And uh, typically, the age range from that is about a 13-year-old thir boy all the way up to, what do we have typically, 85? Uh, 13 to 85 is the age range in that discussion. So it's a brilliant discussion about responsibility, the scriptures, life. It's a discussion format studying the scriptures. And it's always, always dynamic and life-giving. All right, so there is teaching that goes on there from the older men to the younger men, many times the younger men to the older men. It's a wonderful, vibrant, respectful discussion that goes on. But it's interesting that the scripture says that for women, it's more of a learned skill to be able to love guys. I understand that because we men... Well, we were God's first attempt, and of course, he had to revamp things, and then he made the women. And so, so this thing of a family, of a father, a, a dad, a man, and a woman coming together, falling in love, and out of that love, producing offspring. And then, as the offspring grow, they're able to look at their dad to learn certain things in life. They're able to look at their mom to learn different things in life and complementary things in life. And as they grow, watching mom and dad and learning things from mom and dad, they can grow into healthy, vibrant people. Now, all of us know some people are in difficult situations where they as an individual man or they as an individual woman have to raise children on their own. Sometimes that happens. And of course, that's why churches are important. So if it's a single mom raising a kid, uh, like for instance, if a single mom raised uh, a son in our church, uh, she would have the other men in the church as a resource. 
Royal Rangers with Bob and the other guys leading, that would be a wonderful resource to help that young man grow. And we would work together to produce a healthy young man, but there would be a little more effort involved with a single mom raising that young man than there would be if the biological mom and biological dad were raising that child alone. All the, st the statistics, the research is universal. The greatest opportunity any of us have to be healthy happens when our biological mother and father love one another, stay together, and raise us. So the opportunity for a child growing up with their biological mother and father at home, there's a less likelihood of drug addiction, less likelihood of premarital pregnancies, less likelihood of uh, uh, breaking the law as they go through adolescence, they have a much greater likelihood of being able to be healthy. Now, that doesn't mean that if somebody is raised from a broken home that they're going to be unhealthy. It's just going to be a greater challenge. All right, so what we want to build in this church is we want to build healthy young men. We want to build healthy young women so that our healthy young men can grow up and be strong, competent, responsible fathers and husbands. And we want the young women in the church to grow up to be strong, competent, healthy young women so they can be, as they go into the workforce, they can be competent, strong wives, mothers, whatever the Lord calls them to be so that their home can be intact. All right, so this is going to be kind of an informal discussion today. I'm not going to preach, preach. I know that's a real disappointment. Sorry, Norm, I know that makes you sad. Yeah, I know. All right, so, so what I've asked, I contacted four of the guys this week, and I just said, I want you to just kind of in an informal way think of some of the things that are your goals or your values or things that you would highlight as you're growing and being a dad and as you're developing and being a dad. And, um, and so all these guys are already accomplished in their professional careers. They're already highly respected professionally out in the workforce. They all have wives that love them and adore them. I'll just tell you that right up front because I know all their wives, their wives think the world of you. I know that probably news to you, Kent, but she absolutely adores you. All right, isn't that right, Andrea? This is your chance not to just shake your head, but to say, yow. <laughs> She's back there going, <laughs> All right, and so, so, so anyway, their wives love them. They're professionals in their careers. They're doing a great job, but they have these little ones around the house. And of course, if you'll notice, if you'll look at your bulletin, we're starting off with Kyle that's got a three-year-old around the house. But knowing Kyle, he's got goals, objectives. He's got things that he wants to do. And here's, how, here's what I said to Kyle at the service. I said, Kyle, here's the deal. Probably you're going to die and be buried before your daughter dies. After you've been buried for 10 years, what do you want her to remember about you? What message would you like in her mind? And so we're going to discuss that a little bit. Then we'll go to David. And by the way, David, it's Springer, S-P-R-I-N-G. E -R, I added the S just to add some personality. Okay, now he is the father of Broderick, which I'm sure you have seen around the church. Very often Broderick will be over here playing drums during the service, or he'll be uh, doing something else when he's in one of our performances, he's always outstanding. And then he's got, so he's got a five-year-old boy, then he's got uh, a three-year-old and an 11-month-old. All right, so we'll go from Kyle to David. Then we're going to talk to Jeff. Jeff has two grown children. You saw Dylan arriving this morning with great fanfare. All right, and so, so he's got two grown children. Then we're going to go to Kent, and here is Kent's list. By the way, 
Andrea, how did, is this right? Did I get it right? See, that's awesome. Thank you for responding since Kent would not respond. Okay, which by the way was somewhat predictable. And so that's why I wrote you after I wrote Kent a couple times, no response. I thought, oh, I'll call it. All right. So here you see the oldest is 29, and it goes down to one of the grandchildren at two, and all those ages. And Kent is one of the best dads I've ever known all my life. He's back there shaking his head. No, he doesn't like this. He's kind of a Mennonite in personality. But so, yeah, so the greatest sin is any sin of pride or anything like that. But no kidding, everybody. Now, listen, I've pastored thousands of people in my lifetime. I've watched thousands and thousands of families. I've seen loads of men that are professional on the circuit teaching how to be a dad and how to be a father. And very, very often, sadly, I'd see those situations and they, their kids were a disaster. The opposite is the case with Kent. He's, relative, he's a physician here in town. He's soft-spoken, typically. He's fun-loving. He prioritizes his children. He's done a great job. Their house is incredible. The whole house is designed with kids in mind. All right. And several people are like that. Uh, Sam Berenger's house was like that. All right. But this guy, his kids love him as Cal Zeb was going through high school. Very all Cal Zeb's a, a star in his high school, but I'd see Kent and Cal Zeb back here snuggling while I'd be up teaching the scripture because his kids love him. And so I wanted him to share. And I knew if I asked him all by himself, he'd just say no. So I asked him in a group thing, and then I kind of used his wife to leverage him just a little bit. Okay, it takes skill to deal with these guys. And then after that, we're going to have Gail share a few minutes about how awesome women see men in such glorious light. And, and how, how moms, as the years go by, women love men even more. Okay, we're doing good here. All right. Okay, then after that, then I'm going to wrap things up and, and then we'll go celebrate Father's Day. Kyle, why don't you come on up? Let's all welcome Kyle. All right. All right. Kyle and I met over the phone. He and his wife moved here. They're out here. Let's see, where are you, where are you working right now? Uh, at Let's see. Let me make sure this is up. Yeah. And then hold it up here because the antenna is down here. And it'll, okay. okay. Is that better? Yeah. Is he on? Hello? All right. Yeah, there, there you are. Okay. So you're at Fort Carson. Fort Carson, yep. Okay. Yep. And tell us what you do there. Uh, so I'm a captain in the Army, um, and I actually work more on the administrative side of things. So I'm, I'm actually really fortunate to work in the 10th Special Forces Group at Fort Carson, um, and I'm a support role for them. Um, I'm, I'm what you call a battalion S1, but basically I do human resources and administrative work for them. Awesome. So. Hard-working guy, lives in a beautiful home down here with a gorgeous wife and a gorgeous daughter. Why don't you two stand up so everybody can see the two of you. Look at this couple. All right. Okay, and, I, and okay, so here you are, dad of this precious little jewel. Now, I've, I've watched you hike with her. I've watched you jog pushing her stroller. I've watched you do all kinds of things to spend time with your lovely wife and your beautiful daughter. What in the world are you doing? Good question. <laughs> Kelsey does most of the work. I just want to put that out there. But um, So it's interesting what you said about fathers and how they kind of naturally just love their children because I've, I've absolutely experienced that. Yeah. Um, and actually, Kelsey and I were just talking about this. Was it yesterday or the day before? Uh, when Aria was born, and those of you who know me know that I just worship the ground my daughter walks on. Uh, when she was born, it changed me. I mean, it really changed me from the inside out. I fell in love with that little girl, and I've, I, I, I have no pr problem just loving her so much. And so I recognize that my life is not my own, and that everything that I do and the way that I live is going to have a profound impact on her. Um, when you asked, you know, 
asked us to share this morning. I thought about it, and uh, I guess from my own experience as a child, you know, my parents did a great job, and they did the best that they knew how, but I also understand now as an adult and going through, through some of my own issues that especially in the formative years of a child's development, um, I think we can all agree that a parent's impact and influence in their child's life has a or the influence that they have in their child's life has a huge impact on how they see the world as an adult, how they see God, and how they feel about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would say the biggest uh, thing that I want to accomplish as a father is I want Aria and any more children that we have to know how loved and valuable they are as people. Um, so that, you know, in their teenage years and in their young adult years, they don't go looking for that love in the wrong places and end up in really bad situations, you know. And so I want Aria to know that her daddy loves her more than the world. I love you. <laughs> and uh, because I know that she's going to see God the way that she sees me and her mom, yeah. you know. And so I, that's, that's what I want for her. Wow, that is fabulous. Okay, so there is no everything you've said there I think is true. And everything you've said there I see reflected in you. I see you make a conscious effort. I mean, you, just look at your Facebook page. It's full of pictures of the three of you doing things together and, and you focusing on your daughter on a practical level. I mean, you work hard. You work a lot of hours. All right, so... During those hours, you're gone. So when you come home, do you even think about how she's going to see you coming home <coughs> and how that's going to impact your relationship or what you do on Saturdays? Do you take off again and go, go do stuff with the guys or do you have to be intentional about being home with your daughter? How does all that work on a practical level? So, um, you know, work-life balance is a hard thing that I think all we men are, are spend our lives trying to figure out um, because I think it's important that our kids see us work. It's not, I don't think it's good to, to, for children to see their fathers not producing in their lives. Um, so I, I do take my job very seriously and I, I enjoy working. Um, I enjoy being gone and, and doing what I do, but I also very much enjoy being home. So this is, this is kind of a funny topic, though, too, because Kelsey and I were raised very differently in, the, in this aspect. So the home I grew up in, again, my parents did the best job they knew how. But the home I grew up in, every Saturday was cleaning day. Oh, every, I love that. Oh, I hated it. Oh, <laughs> this is how you turned out to be a good man. They made you work on Saturdays. This is very good. Go well, ahead, Saturday Kyle. was all day cleaning. Oh, wonderful. And Sunday was all day church. Yes. And, and that's, See, this is perfect parenting. <laughs> This is the way to do it. We're too concerned about being our kids' friends. We need to make them work more. Yeah. Well, Kelsey came from the opposite. The, every weekend they went and did, you know, they went to the park, they went on hikes, they did things as a family. And so she has lots of good childhood memories. Conversely, I do not. <laughs> So it's funny now that... I think that, you're off track here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I, th I think there's a balance there. Um, you know, it's, oh, that was a perfect save. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I I'm good at that. I think there's a balance here. Good job. <laughs> um, we, uh, so we, we just started owning our first home this year because you know, we're in the military. It's hard to own property. So, so I, I've actually really started enjoying doing yard work. And so the first thing that I want to do on a Saturday is take care of the house. Good man. And it's good, but it was the same exact thing my dad did. And he's told me now that I'm an adult. He said, man, I, I used to tell myself every week I'm going to spend this weekend with my boys, and I would always end up doing yard work instead. And so we've talked a lot about it, and so I, I think we want to keep a good balance there where definitely when I'm home on the weekends, um, we at least do a couple things as a family um, so that we're being intentional about spending time together and not getting too wrapped up in, you know, well, I know what I'm getting her for her next birthday. I'm going to get her a little lawnmower. <laughs> so while you're going along mowing the grass, she can be mowing the grass because that's being a good St. James member. <laughs> Mow the grass on Saturday morning. Okay, now this is very interesting that you bring this up because I think in our culture, when we say, see, I agree with you, it's very important for her to see you working 
and working hard and responsibly. And, and, and when they say, where's daddy? Well, he's working so that we can go on vacation or so that we can buy a car or so that we can have, I think all those things are honorable. And I think sometimes like when she gets older and has a softball game or a volleyball game or whatever, and sometimes you're there, that's great. But I think there are sometimes when you shouldn't be there where you should be deployed or at work or whatever. And so she knows responsible men are workers because I think that's a, a very important thing. It's interesting right now they're doing research on the suicide rate amongst high school students. It's very interesting that there's virtually no suicide rate amongst high school students from poor families whose fathers work a job or two really hard. The highest suicide rates amongst adolescents are from what we call helicopter parents. Parents that show up for everything. They provide the orange slices. They have the juice boxes. They show up for everything. They're there all the time. And somehow it's affecting their kids into thinking that they're right in the center of everything. And then when difficulty comes their way, they don't do so well. And so there has to be that balance of a child seeing dad working hard, being responsible, doing a good job, and showing up every chance he gets, you know, doing those types of things. Now, my love language is acts of service. And so I love people that I work with. So for me, on Saturday mornings, I'd say, hey, everybody, it's Saturday morning. Let's get out of bed and mow the grass. I thought that was me saying, I love you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kyle. Let's all thank Kyle for his word. <laughs> okay, David, come on up. This is David Springster. <laughs> it's actually Springer. All right. Great guy. This is Ashley, his wonderful bride Hello. right back here, whom we have known since she was just a little tyke. And and then got to know you when you fell in love with her. Yeah. And that was we just thought it was wonderful. We think you're great <laughs> to be in it. We're actually thank you, thank you for marrying uh, Ashley. That's and what so, Bruce says all the time. <laughs> thank you. That's what Bruce says. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, so anyway, same idea. Okay, so yeah. you have these three kiddos. Yeah. All right, so you're in the stage right now where wife is running fast to keep up with the kids. <sighs> yeah. You are working hard to make sure things are covered. The two of you are probably really ready to go to bed at the end of the day. Yes, and that's so, exactly what happens. All right, so tell, tell me about, or tell all of us about what you're thinking, what your goals are, yeah. what your objectives are. You're highly respected at work. You're highly respected as a dad. Your wife adores you. So how in the world are you doing this, David? <sighs> that's a great question. That's the grace of God most of the time that keeps me moving in the morning. Okay, but, the um, grace of God. Okay, so we all take that as a given for all the dads yeah. that are going to be speaking today, right? That's right. So let's go that's for the, the practical. So the practical... Um, so the practical for me, a shift kind of occurred in the last two years where I went from trying to survive to trying to have relationships with my kids, which was kind of, it was amazing, right? As their personalities started coming out, especially my son and now my daughter, who's three and a half, um, I, I really was able to, instead of just, you know, coach and demand and kind of push them uh, as, as a dad, I, it transferred more to, to how do I have a relationship with this person? Like, Broderick has a personality. He loves Star Wars. He loves Army Men. He will blow up your house if you ask him to. Listen, I, And he'll also come mow that's the grass why with I you. When I watch him around here, I say, I am so looking forward to watch him when he's 15. Yeah. Because this guy is a live wire. I mean, yeah. there is so personality, so much person. Now, I told Gail, when our kids were born, I told Gail, you raise them until they become people. <laughs> Yeah. And then once there's a personality in there, I want to know them then. But right, I don't understand this. And, and they're and, people. And they started to become these people that were awesome. They're amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And they, well, and even that, that process continues now. Like my children yeah. now, sometimes when they tell me what they think politically, I think, where did they get <laughs> that crazy idea? Yeah. But, but they continue to be their own people. So that's your intention right now. 
Yeah, I mean, so the, the ultimate attention, intention is to raise adults, right? That's the goal is to get an, a capable, God-loving adult out of the household when yeah. they're 18. When they're 18. Yeah, you didn't forget 18. that, but go yeah. ahead. Okay, well, that, that's the goal. <laughs> and, and I think that a lot of that does stem from relationships. And so the fun part to me of having a three-year-old is that she tells me when the relationship is trouble immediately by bursting into tears or she does all of her emotions. Yeah. And how, right? how's Broderick with that? Well, and so Broderick now he's five and now he's a real person. And now he instead expresses it in his words subtly, which is, it's a fascinating transition in just those two years that the relationship dynamic has changed from, you know, just an outburst of frustration or tears to now, like, he subtly expresses, hey, Dad, you probably aren't spending enough time with me. Really? Hey, he says that? No, he doesn't. That's how I have to interpret it. Oh, you it. interpret it. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I he'll was going to say, say, man, his IQ must be through the roof. No, no, no. See, so he does it by, like, <laughs> okay, fine, right? Yeah. When you ask him to do something simple that he does every day. Yeah. Okay, buddy, put away the dishes. Okay, fine. Really? Yeah, but what that really means is, Dad, like, I'm not feeling your warmth. I'm not feeling your love right now. Spend some time in that relationship with me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna respond better to you. Oh, you are a much more kind dad than I was. No, well, when my cat my kids would do the okay fine thing, I would say stand up straight and go do what your mother told you to do. <laughs> right, right. So we I never it. it never once crossed my mind that they needed warmth. Maybe that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so we always try to address it, right? It's not okay to talk back. So, buddy, would you like to try something else? Yeah. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. And then a few minutes later, give him a few minutes, let him execute his task, uh -huh. and then come back to him and work on that relationship again with him. And that's, as a father, that's the wow. thing that I've started valuing more you and more. You are so much like God. Uh, he wrote a good book. I, I read it a bunch. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, so that's where I'm at. How do I raise these, these little yeah. people into capable adults? And I think to me at the moment, a lot of that is just the relationship with my two little humans. Yeah. And Tell me this. Have you ever noticed how they respond when you and Ashley are affectionate with each other in front of them? <sighs> that's interesting. I don't know if I have necessarily okay. noticed that. You know We're what's pretty interesting? pretty affectionate. Pretty huh? constantly, so. You're affectionate constantly? Yeah. We've been called out on that. I'm looking at Ashley's dad like, prepare for more grandchildren. No, it's more fun <laughs> to let them imagine. <laughs> okay. But, but so you're right. So, so they do pick up on that dynamic, the dynamic See, when you're, you're arguing or when there's tension. Oh, yeah. They can sense it, which is fascinating. Yeah, these, they don't like it when there's three tension and five year old mom and are, dad. are picking up on that. It's incredible how they can pick up on it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Truly amazing. Yeah. Gail and I have noticed that when we are great with one another and mm -hmm. warm toward one another and love one another, that makes the kids okay. Well, so I totally agree. I think another yeah. part of it is that it, like having that confidant and that close support helps me to have that extra patience that I need with the kids as well. So the, the marriage dynamic is truly important for us and our kids right now because you know, when I'm out of town or Ash was just out of town three days last week and I had all three to myself, like my temper was a about this you had big. all three kids by yourself in the home? <sighs> well, see, we never did that because yeah. we, we, we thought that was a potential uh, legal problem. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> like, we didn't even have to go to the ER. I'm still amazed. Yeah, that's so. incredible. That would have never happened at our house. Yeah. Well, you're a good dad, no doubt about it. Okay, so tell me this. Yeah. You, you're, how old were you when Broderick was born? I was 30. 30? 31. All right, so 30. you'll be dead probably before they will. Oh, so hopefully. Um, so, so once you're dead 10 years or so, what message, what, what would the message be? That, like when they'd say, like Dad always said, or if they would say, uh, uh, you know, Dad, and then say something about you. Now, you've been dead 10 years. Yeah. What would you like that message to be in them? Um, I'd like to, I hope it's, you know, dad always took the time to talk with me. Wow. You are such a nice guy. <laughs> well, like, so, so it's interesting in, in the culture right now, in my generation, it's all about just being friends with your kids. Yeah. But I don't think I've that's, I've never believed in that. I don't think that's enough. 
Mostly because when I like, if I have had a drag out fight like I've had with my kids, yeah, with a friend, then we're no longer friends, and that's the end. Yeah, like, now, our see, relationship but, is so much deeper than just a absolutely. Friendship. See, now this is a huge point you're on right now, yeah. because your generation is somewhat known for temporary work situations yeah. and temporary relationships. Right, and if something gets uncomfortable, you just move on. Or you stare at your phone. It's either or. Or you, what? Yeah. Right, read your phone. Yeah. Okay, that works. So, so your primary, now that's, this is very interesting to me, everybody. So your primary intention is that they would remember you're a long-term relationship guy. That's right. Yep. You don't leave when the going gets rough. Nope, better not. <laughs> wow, yeah. I think that's awesome. It takes awesome. a lot of strength to not uh, leave when the going gets rough. I, th I think it's totally countercultural for your generation. Mm -hmm. And so, see, for my generation, we still have, we, back in my day, we had brand loyalty. If we bought Fords, we were a Ford family or a Crest right. family or a, you know, Golden Retriever family. Well, we're all Apple families now, right? Huh? We're all Apple families now. Everybody's now we're Apple, Apple family. families, yeah. Until they do something we don't like. Yeah. And so that is very interesting. Thank you, David. Let's yeah. all thank David for this. That was great. Very good. Thank you. All right. Very good. Okay, now let's go. Let's keep moving along here. That was fascinating to me. Yours was fascinating to me. I'm learning so much this morning about how to be a father. And so I need to try this on our grandchildren. Okay, um, uh, let's go to Jeff Hoyle. Jeff, come on up. And let's all give Jeff a hand, especially Dylan. Give him a hand. All right. Okay, now Jeff... Uh, so what, do you, what are your goals with your kiddos? I know they're grown now. And, uh, and you heard David's thought that his kids would be gone by the time they're 18. You and I both know that in this generation that may or may not happen. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> And it's okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, Marcus arrived at our house at 4 o'clock this morning. He drove his, one of his cars and his dog and his frog back to Colorado. Now he's going to fly home tonight. And so, so he's, he's at the house crashed. And, so, and it's great. We were thrilled that he arrived, you know. And so tell us what, what you've learned being a dad and what you are learning being a dad and what your goals are. Okay. Well, it's interesting following the guys that are still in the wonder years. Those were are, those are great years. <laughs> Cherish them. They're awesome. Um, that always scared me when people would come up to me at the mall and say, you know, these are precious years. Take lots of pictures and just remember this because your future is hell. <laughs> and, and it wasn't it can be true. true. Our, our future, no. Our, it, it can be true. It, can't, it depends on how you look at it. Life is life, you know. <laughs> no, Did your uh, wife and daughter just leave? <laughs> oh, just in the nursery? Okay. <laughs> okay. So... No, you can go through difficulties with kids. I know we have some. I, nobody else probably in here has, but we have. So uh, my angle to talk about this morning was kind of going to be a little bit different, which is how to handle it when you have to go through struggles with your kids. And um, so it, kind of um, my wife and I's goal right now with our children is – the number one thing is just to always keep our hearts open and soft and not to, not to harden our hearts, but just to love them constantly and stay in a good relationship with them, regardless. Very good. And the haggard phrase for that is, the relationships are more important than the rules. Yeah, it's not about winning. It's not about winning. It's important to know. If you're still in relationship, you have opportunity for influence. If you lose the relationship, you forfeit the, forfeited the opportunity for influence. That's right. And you, you don't want to be separated from your kids. And, you know, I think um, sometimes it gets, you know, it's difficult because you hate to see your kids struggle and go through the, the things that they put themselves through with their choices. But... Um, I just have focused on always seeing them the same way that I saw them when they were young 
and innocent and awesome. I, I don't know about you guys, but I happen to have the smartest, best-looking, most talented kids ever. Ever. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Mine are the best. Right. No <laughs> doubt. And I just always see them that way, no matter what they're going through. Yeah. And um, it's awesome. I love my kids. And I think because Chris and I have taken that approach, my kids still love me. Yeah, they Which do. is a miracle. <laughs> yes, it is. So it's awesome. I've known Jeff for a long time. And so, no, I, I think I, I've watched you go. Hey, let me tell you the type of kids Jeff has. Okay, Jeff used to have the great big snowboard deal here in town. And so Jeff would take me snowboarding from time to time. So one time I was standing in the line to go on the ski lift up to go snowboarding and Dylan comes up and he looks at what I'm wearing and he said, this is just really bad. Dad, we have to fix this. He can't wear these. I don't know where he even gets this stuff. <laughs> And so Dylan was determined to help me look better on the slopes, which really helped. Yeah, yeah, we um, we hooked Ted up with a really sweet outfit. You did, some good you did. Gear. You took care of it because of Dylan's impetus, and I appreciate. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. Well, and love you much. What one of my rules in snowboarding is, you can't always look the way you want to look when you're riding down the mountain because you might have skill problems or whatever but you can always Why'd you look at me when you said that yeah, well <laughs> but you can always look awesome in the lift line yeah you've got the right gear. <laughs> that is your takeaway you can always look good in the lift line that's right <laughs> so before you come tumbling down the hill <laughs> all right so the message i'm getting from you is that Relationship is more important than the rules. You maintain communication no matter what. No matter and, what. and you maintain your love for them no matter what stage they're going through. Yes, exactly. That sounds a lot like our Heavenly Father too. From you, I hear our Heavenly Father. From you, I'm hearing our Heavenly Father. And from you, I hear our Heavenly Father. Anything else before Kent comes up? Uh, I, I guess I'd say one more thing, which is I think that sometimes the enemy attacks our children to try to get to us. And you've got you've to battle for your kids. And you do that in prayer. Don't battle with them, battle for them. So that's... That yep, was. always before them. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jeff. Let's all thank God, Jeff, God for Jeff. Kent, if you don't want to come on up. All right. This is Kent Roberson. Many of you know him, know him and have known him for a long time. He's got an awesome family. He's a great physician in our city. People love him. And, um, and you're just steady. I mean, you go to the games. You're at the matches. You've been, you, you've raised, here you are somewhat of a pacifist, and you've raised these mighty warrior sons and daughters that are spiritual powerhouses and then they get on the rugby field or whatever and they tear people to pieces and so so i mean hair everywhere and they growl and they they i mean this is an incredible family you have and uh they love you how do you feel how are you <laughs> Um, you know, I'm, I tell my kids that I had a terrible, violent temper as a child, and I <laughs> punched through many windows, but God got a hold of me, and so they have to live through it, too. So it's just, you know, I've raised warrior children, even my daughter. I know. It, they're all spiritually powerful. They're physically strong. They're bright, sharp, articulate people. Even Jess can write a paragraph now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just stand up and take the glory. You've earned it. Okay, so, <laughs> so tell us. Okay, so you and Andrea start this family. Of course, when you're starting a family, you don't really know where that's going to lead. Tell us about what your goals were, what you were thinking about being the dad, about being a husband, about raising these kiddos as they came along. Um, 
Just talk to us a little bit. Yeah, a couple of scriptures I'm going to jump in as I was thinking about this. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of the core as I think about it. And what I did is talk to my kids this week and said, what did I do good as a dad? What did I, what, tell me what I should have done better. And a couple of scriptures came up. The first one, 1 Corinthians 9.19, I think is really pivotal as I think about it. And this is in the Amplified Version. It says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to everyone so that I may win more for Christ. And I paraphrase that. I've said it over the years. I'm a slave to no one, but a servant to everything. Hmm. Or a servant to all. I'm a slave to nothing, including my job, my um, social pressures. But I'm a slave to everyone. I'm a servant to everyone, however that goes. But yeah, that's, you get it. The yeah, they're used to listening to me, so they'll follow what you meant, that's not right. what you actually said. They knew it yeah. perfect. <laughs> the other one is interesting, Jonah 2.8, that came off of yesterday's reading when Christ said, I'll just give you the sign of Jonah. And I'm trying to figure out what the heck that meant. I still don't understand it. But one of the things I came across, so this is a rabbit trail, those who worship false gods turn their backs on all of God's mercy. It's even better in the Amplified. So let me pull it up real quick. Jonah, what did I say? Two, eight. <clears throat> Thank you. Five, six, seven, eight. Those who worship false gods turn their, nope, still new living. Sorry. Technology. It's a good place to stay. You living, yeah. but you want the amplified? No, amplified. Yeah, those who regard and follow worthless idols turn away from the living source of mercy and loving kindness. Hmm. That phrase wow. just grabbed me. That's powerful. The living source of mercy and loving kindness. That's the kind of people I want my kids to be. The servant of all. One of the things we did uh, deliberately, Andre and I, is on their birthday, we told them, you know, in this culture, most of the time, birthdays are all about the kid. We said, hey, you have to serve people today because that's why God created you. That's why we had you. You are servants. And so we just tried to be deliberate. Yeah. And we succeeded sometimes and we blew yeah, it develop, mercifully. It illustrate other times. that with a couple stories. So, on their birthday, they were created to be servants. So how would you work that out in a practical way? You know, it depended on the child in the moment yeah. is the other lesson we've learned. The child in the moment is a huge thing as a parent. Discerning the moment. One time it's shut up and go do what I said. Another time it's come, let me hear about what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And as a dad, man, you need the Holy Spirit to figure that out. And about half the time you don't, but God's grace then helps you to do it the other half the time. Yeah, see, and it's so typical for you to say about half the time you miss it, and da, da 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 but your kids don't think that. See, the people around you think more highly than you think of yourself. Absolutely. All right. Now, that's interesting because we're living in a culture where lots of people think more highly of themselves than the people around them. Okay? So you have achieved the ability for your family to respect you. It happens in the men's meeting too. You'll be setting up there in the men's meeting and as we're talking through the scriptures or whatever, you'll throw something in humbly and kindly and it's dramatic. But when you need a sword, you're able to wield it. Like I remember one time we had a cocky young man up there that said, uh, let's see, how did he word it? All the guys were talking. He was the youngest man in the room. And the guys were talking, and he started off his analysis by saying, I would take a more academic view of this scripture. And then he went ahead and explained his view of it. All the guys laughed. The guy didn't know why. He, and they patiently let him speak. Then I saw Kent go up to him afterward and he put his arms around him, and he held him, and he kind of hugged him the way he did. And then he said, you know, I want to get to know you and enjoy you because I used to be arrogant like that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I heard that out of the corner, and I started laughing, and I thought, that is why he's such a great dad. He can hug you and with the most gentle tones tell you you're arrogant, and I'm going to beat that out of you, boy. <laughs> yeah, we have another saying we're talking about this morning is, it's all fun and games till somebody's bleeding, and then it's hilarious. <laughs> Oh, that is great. All right, so Kent, there's coming a day when you're going to be in the grave and all the kids are going to be going on with their lives. When they think back about you as father, what do you want them to think? Yeah, and, uh, you know, this is a difficult one for me because, as you say, I'm an Anabaptist Mennonite at the core. And there's just, you know, it's like, well. Uh, he was my dad, um, but <laughs> uh, but I was thinking about that. In, in, okay, uh, so here, let me develop this just a little bit. We are living in a generation where people that have not even lived a life, I mean, they just barely existed. They were literally a vapor, and they are trying to leave a legacy to make sure everybody remembers them all their life because, of course, they're so awesome. Okay, here we're seeing the opposite of that. But you are leaving a legacy. You're yeah. leaving a legacy in this church with me personally. You're leaving a legacy with your children, with your wife, your, your grandchildren. You're leaving a legacy. But have you thought about, or would you consider that proud? No, uh, you know, it, it, that's my limitation is I consider it proud. But I'm, I can think it through enough to get there. Okay. Um, a couple things my kids said. Uh, one of my kids... Um, said, Dad, what I really appreciated about how you raised me was you helped me to think things through and know why I believe, not just what I believe. Very and good. I think that's an incredible legacy that I see in my kids. Their faith is their faith. They're not just doing it because I said do this. Yeah. I've challenged them to know why they believe what they believe. And that is an incredible legacy. And one of my sons pointed out, it was pretty awesome. That goes back to my father. And we were talking about that verse that says, I will uh, bless you for generations. Yeah. Well, part of that is getting the right ideas. Yeah. And my dad uh, came to Christ later in life. He grew up on the streets of Chicago. And that's probably where I get my violent streak. Mm. Um, when he came back from the war, mom and dad tell the story. They were on a date. Some guy pulled a knife on him, said, give me your wallet. And he said, hell no, and beat the crap out of the guy, <laughs> left him on the street, and they finished their date. So that was kind of <laughs> my legacy from my father. But it, then he became a Baptist, which was really tough for this Chicago kid. And uh, he would always wear shorts to church just to torque people off. <laughs> And so, you know, I had that legacy of understand and do, not just because culture says it, but because it's your faith and the scripture and you've proved it out. And that's really what I value in my kids is when, and that's kind of what you said, you know, where do these kids come up with these ideas? Yeah, which I like. Yeah. I love, we can have dinner at our house and it'll go three hours and it's vibrant discussion, lots of food being consumed and thrown. Yeah. And and it's and it's a delightful, wonderful exchange of thoughtful ideas. It's not shared ignorance. Right. And I love that. Yeah. And, and our kids growing up responsible, capable, competent uh, people. And you challenge that with the men as well as challenging it with with your home, I think. Yeah. And that's what Andrea and I have. I, I like sometimes using the term deliberate parenting. Yeah. Um, I, I want my kids to be deliberate parents, deliberate people of faith, not just flowing through. Yeah. And that's, you know, if I think about a legacy I want to live, that's what I want to live. I also want my boys, because I have four boys, one girl, yeah. uh, to be deliberate uh, good fathers and husbands. And one of the things that all the kids brought up that's interesting, just as a tidbit, sort of off track a little bit here, is uh, one of the things I did well um, to be deliberate is I, I Andrea, have I ever had just one job? 
I don't think so. I, I can't think of it. I've always had multiple yeah. jobs and plenty busy. And Andrea has said this before, and I hadn't thought about it. Um, she says, I don't know the veracity of this, that I've never come home and said, honey, what's for dinner, and asked her to fix it. If it's not ready, I say, all right, here's our options. What are we going to do? Wow, good. And, um, and my kids brought that up sometimes as a valuable lesson to them. But it goes back to the servant. Um, I don't figure I'm owed anything. And that's why I like your phrase, yeah. live as if no one owes you anything. Nobody owes us. And I am a servant to right. all. Now, for those of you that don't follow that, I maintain... See, people get their feelings hurt when people don't love them, or people don't forgive them, or people aren't kind to them, or people are, don't remember their name or whatever. Where our rule is, nobody owes us to remember our name. Nobody owes us respect. Nobody owes us love. Nobody owes us forgiveness. And that way, when forgiveness comes your way, or love comes your way, you're grateful. So you're always able to stay grateful unless you start to think other people owe you something. And if you think other people owe you something, then you're going to get your feelings hurt. You're going to get wounded or offended or whatever. And that, in my culture, when people say I'm offended, that means you're a baby. <laughs> you know, you need to cool off on yourself, grow up a little bit, and be the man or woman God created you to be, which means you're responsible for yourself and others don't need to prop, up you, prop you up emotionally. Right? Right. Is that the idea? Exactly. Okay. The, the point being, I am back to that scripture. You know, I'm deliberately a servant to my kids and my wife and the people around me. It's a, it's a choice. It's a deliberate, uh, purposeful. And that's, a lot a, that, and that's a perfect example of Jesus. Yeah. A deliberate right. choice to be a servant. And we are to love our li wives as Christ loves the church. We're to take care of our children the way Christ takes care of us as the children of God. And that's an example of that. And it is, sometimes you think, oh, that's weak. No, that is the ultimate man, to have the strength to be a servant and not demand stuff. It's a weak man who demands stuff. It's a powerful man who serves because it's a choice. That's the other half of that. I'm a slave to nothing and no one. I am a powerful man because I can serve. Ah, oh, it's just so powerful. Isn't this a great morning? Don't you think? Just great. Okay, anything else? Uh, there was a couple other things the kids said. Oh, where did I screw it up? If I may take liberty and give Jess 30 seconds. Let's see if we can hold it to this. All right. Jess, can you tell that story real quick? Come on, Jess. About run, what run, I, run, something run. I didn't do well. You know, we're up here saying all the things I did well, so you need some hope that I screwed it up a lot. Okay, so this is an incredible redemptive story of my dad and my relationship. All right. Um, so I was 19 years old and I was getting ready to go to Bible college, not because I was a wonderful kid, but because I was not a wonderful kid. <laughs> and uh, we got in an argument about something and I started yelling. We were, I, well, I don't know if he was yelling at me. I was yelling at him, but it was pretty escalated. And uh, I started yelling at him and I said, you never told me you were proud of me. Now. <laughs> With that statement, I didn't do anything that I deserved him to be proud of me for. So, but that was a wound in my heart that I had as a kid. And if I look back at it, everything I did in sports, I wasn't great at school, so I really tried to excel in sports, which I was good at. It was all I saw I was trying to please my, my dad. I wanted him to be proud of me because he was this incredible guy. So I yelled this, I said, you never told me you were proud of me. And you know, in a fight, you would think most dads would be like, yeah, well, you didn't deserve it, so. But that didn't happen. My dad broke down in tears and he said, Jess, I am so sorry. I never told you I was proud of you. My dad never told me he loved me and I wanted to always make sure that you knew that I loved you, but I didn't even think that you needed to hear that. And it kind of threw me off, I was like, what, did I break my dad? Like, oh man, like, <laughs> now I, I'm dad. really the worst. Like, <laughs> and so then I went to college, you know, it kind of settled out and it didn't go anywhere. I went to college and my dad sent me a note with, I mean, it was pretty basic. It was just information you sent me. And on this note, right at the bottom of it said, I'm proud of you. Oh, that's awesome. And it, I still have that note with me today. And that is, you know, as Ted, you were saying, he's a humble man. 
My dad is a humble man, and he uses that as a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you go, there you go, there you go. Make notes. Now, now, now that is not an intentional weapon, but humbleness, humbleness destroys, <laughs> humbleness destroys any work of the enemy, any kind of pride, true humbleness just blows through that. And my dad displays that in a way that is unbelievable because that's who he is. And he's gotten there because he listens to the Holy Spirit and he loves his kids. So that's that story. <laughs> so a couple points in that uh, as a dad. I had to recognize my own woundedness was affecting my relationship with my kids. So understand your own woundedness can mess stuff up and be honest about it. And you know, it took an argument for me to be honest about it. The second thing is when you I love the line, oh, I broke my dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I was acting out of my own woundedness, trying to fulfill my needs to let him know I was loved and I missed what he needed. Uh, that's awesome. The second component is it is God's grace that allows us to say, you know, I screwed up. And that is wonderful as a dad. When you really screw it up, go fix it. Yeah. No kidding. Great, Kent. Thank you so much. Everybody, let's... Thank you, doctor. All right, Mrs. Haggard. Let's all welcome Gail Haggard. All right. I, uh, I think I might as well sit down. <laughs> no, I'll just take a minute here. Haven't you appreciated the dad wisdom we've heard from these men today, every single one of them? And so, all oh, that was such light applause. It was just kind of yeah. No, it wasn't. It was right. it was resounding. I heard it. So, oh yeah. I, <laughs> stop. I, I think the okay. golden nuggets with every one of them. It was just great. Thank you, Gail. We appreciate you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do have something to say. Um, could you put up the, the thing that I, um, yeah, how to be a parent in 2017, this is 2018. Um, I just want us to look at this for a minute because I think uh, we see this in our culture a lot. Here's how to be a parent, and it could be a father or a mother because it's kind of uh, equal now, but it says make sure your children's academic, emotional, psychological, mental, spiritual, physical, nutritional, and social needs are met while being careful not to overstimulate, understimulate, and properly medicate, helicopter, or neglect them in a screen-free, processed foods-free, GMO-free, negative energy-free, plastic-free, <laughs> body-positive, socially conscious, egalitarian, but also authoritative, nurturing, but fostering of independence, <laughs> gentle, but not overly permissive, pesticide free, two-story, multilingual, preferably a, in a cul-de-sac with a backyard and 1.5 siblings spaced at least two years apart for proper development. And also don't forget the coconut oil. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How to be a parent in literally every generation before ours. Feed them sometimes. <laughs> My dad grew up during the Depression years, and he, he would tell the story of them having a, a dinner meal of cornbread and milk, and then his dad saying, let's all go to bed quick before we get hungry again. <laughs> that was life. And he turned out to be a pretty amazing man. Yes, he did. As did many throughout all time. And so I just wanted to share a few of the things that we really appreciate about dads. And one of the things is their strength. And I love the way Kent demonstrated that. And that it doesn't always come through, you know, in He-Man physical strength, which Jess demonstrated. <laughs> um, but, but sometimes it's through just that, that self-control, that wisdom. And, and I love how, that Jess said that his dad uses his humility as, as a weapon. Um, but it's, it's the strength that is God-given to men. And I'm just saying this because I had a feeling none of the men that got up today would say that about themselves. But it is what we appreciate. It's what families, what women appreciate about men is the strength and stability, their stableness that they bring to the people around them. 
It's huge in family development. I love that Ted said the, you know, sticking through, thick or thin, you know, you stay in it. I think David mentioned that too, that, you know, you just stay in the relationship. There is something that men bring that is so um, strengthening and stabilizing to the rest of us. And I want to say that about dads. And there are men in this room who are fathers of, of physical children, there are men in this room who no longer live, you know, in a home with their children or have never had children, but they still bring that to the lives of those around them. There is a great need for fathers in the church and men who bring just strength and stability that we can all thrive with. And so that is, that is so huge. And, and I know most of us know that in a family, the father is the head of the home. And, and in being the head of the home, he is the chief provider and the chief protector. And these are roles that allow all of those around them to thrive. And that is true in the body of Christ. The fathers allow us all to thrive. And so we are so grateful to the men in, in our lives that allow us to do that, allow us to blossom, allow us to be the people that God's created us to be because of their stability. And this is a huge thank you to the men in our lives that allow us to do that. Um, I just want to say, too, that, that as fathers, you know, all of us, all of you, I guess I'm not a father, um, probably focus a lot on your own failures or shortcomings or weaknesses. And it's sad in our culture that we measure men up against the kind of thing that I read in the beginning. And we measure women up against that, too. That's why the number one characteristic of mothers is guilt. <laughs> we could never do enough, enough. Well, I think fathers bear that a lot. And here's what I want to say. All of us have a good father. Our Heavenly Father is the best at all these things. None of us can claim, you know, that, that we are so damaged because we don't have a good father. All of us have a good father. But today we want to appreciate the men in our midst who are fathers in whatever degree, whether they're our dads or they're men in the body. Whatever their weaknesses or shortcomings are, we all have them. But we want to appreciate the glimpse that the men give us of what God is truly like. Because you may not feel like you do it perfectly because none of us do life perfectly. But you do give us a glimpse. And that strength and stability that you bring to the people around us, around you, is powerful. And the responsibility you carry and the way that you provide, you do not have to be everything on this list. You just have to be who you are in God's image as best you can be. And we will all thrive in that atmosphere. And that's what I have to share. <laughs> okay. Thank you, honey. All right. I think enough has been said, and it has been excellent. Thank you, all you guys that shared, and appreciate it very much. It's very, very good.